because when I raise the price of good J by a dollar, how much poorer are you? Effectively, you've lost, uh, the amount of money you've lost is proportional to your prior consumption of the good, right? So if you were buying 10 bananas and I raise the price of bananas by a dollar, it's like you've lost $10. And so then the size of the income effect is gonna be $10 times DC, DZ, right? And so that's gonna be a negative effect because when I'm raising prices, you're becoming uh, poorer, and then you've got the price effect, and it adds up to the marginal and so, so then just doing that in reverse, I can estimate both of the quantities on the right-hand side. We'll see some examples of that uh, empirically, and then I can back out the slope that I'm interested in. Is that clear? Okay. So now we're going to talk about um, how this works when we have taxes in multiple markets. So all the formulas we derived until now apply to markets where uh, we have a tax on only one good, right? Uh, now with multiple goods, and we're again going to make the assumption of fixed uh, producer prices, as we've been doing once we've allowed uh, income effects, then the excess burden of introducing a tax in market K, which I'm going to call tau K, is given by the following expression, which you can uh, derive by going back to the expenditure functions, but I'm not going to do that here. So you get the standard term which we were talking about before, which is just a Harvard or triangle. That's the effect of introducing tau K in market K multiplied by the slope of the demand in that market, right? The own price elasticity in market K. So we're familiar with that first term. The second term uh, comes from the fact that there are taxes now in all of these other markets. So one way to think about the intuition for this formula is uh, think back to the revenue leakage approach that we had talked about before. How much revenue is the government losing when it introduces the tax because of behavioral responses? All right, so to give you a concrete example, suppose I tax uh, gasoline, all right? Now, there's a deadweight loss from taxing gas because people, some transactions in the gasoline market are not going to occur, and that's going to create a deadweight loss, as we talked about. But there's also deadweight loss because now maybe people don't want to work as much because the cost of commuting has gone up. And so people start to work less, and that creates additional deadweight loss, which is proportional to the tax that the government was levying on income, on labor income, right? So if the government was levying a 40% tax on income and people are starting to work less, that's gonna cost the government revenue, and it's gonna generate deadweight loss related to the intuition we talked about before, because there's this wedge already between the marginal product of labor and the marginal disutility of labor proportional to 40 cents because of that pre-existing tax. And now the fact that you're destroying even more transactions by increasing the gas tax has this first order that with other markets, but what matters here is the cross price elasticity. How much, in the example I was just giving you, does labor supply fall when, uh, when you raise tax rates on gasoline? Okay, so that's how uh, you generalize the formula to having taxes in, in multiple markets. You have a second order effect in the own market and first order effects from other markets with pre-existing taxes. Now this is really important because it shows that complementarity between goods is important for excess burden calculations. So uh, in particular, there's a famous older result by Corlett and Hayes, which says that when you have an income tax, you minimize total deadweight loss of uh, the tax system by taxing goods that are complementary to leisure, right? So think, for instance, about um, something like TV. Suppose we taxed uh, TV shows and what people like to do when they're not working is watch TV. Then if we just thought about it from the perspective of the TV market, we'd say that taxing TV generates that we loss. But when we think about it from the perspective of this multi-market formula, taxing TV is gonna make people wanna work more or consume less leisure. And that's actually gonna have a beneficial effect through the second term. It's gonna reduce dead weight loss in the labor market, okay? So you can see that you need to take into account all these cross price elasticities to really understand the dead weight burden of the tax and ultimately to understand the optimal design of the tax system. Now, what I wanna talk about, yeah. Uh, how's the loss in the leisure account for here? How is the, so the think loss of, in this example, where does that show up? So think of leisure as being one of the goods, right? Okay, so it's one of the Hicksian uh, commodities that you're consuming. 
And you are already, so in the example I was just giving you, you're already consuming um, too much leisure, right? Because in effect, there's a subsidy for leisure. There's a tax on labor, it's the same thing, okay. right? And so then I'm effectively bringing people back closer to all. Okay, so the, what I want to talk about now is a recent paper that uh, applies some of these kinds of uh, ideas empirically. It's Goulder and Williams uh, in the JPE in 2003. And I think this one might have been left off the syllabus, so if that's the case, you know, make sure to look this up. Uh, okay, so what Goulder and Williams show, consistent with the intuition I just described, is that ignoring cross effects by using the one good formula can be very misleading when you think about the deadweight cost of attacks. So they start by differentiating the multiple good Harberger formula on the previous slide with respect to tau k to ask what is the marginal impact of raising the tax on good k to first order, right? So when we take the first derivative, we're getting the first order impact. Uh, so what they um, show, which is just the derivative of the previous formula, is that d b d tau k is given by this term, which depends upon the own price elasticity, and then th these terms here, which depend upon the cross price elasticity, right? Uh, and then it follows immediately that if tau k is small, so for instance, we're thinking about introducing a small gas tax, what matters to first order is purely the distortion in the other markets, for instance, in la labor supply. So as tau k goes to zero, uh, the error in the single market formula approaches infinity, right? So if I just applied this one part of the formula here, like the way we were doing before and ignored the other terms, I would be off by, if I took the ratio of the two death rate losses, that number would go toward infinity. So I'm getting it totally wrong, right? Okay, so the problem uh, which they tackle in this paper, so that insight was old, but the problem that they tackle is that it's very hard to empirically implement this formula on the previous page because you have to estimate too many parameters. There are all these cross price elasticities, like if you have 100 goods, you have to estimate 100 elasticities, right? Which we know is very difficult to do. So they are gonna derive an empirically implementable version of the formula by making three assumptions that are relatively strong, but you'll see allow you to make a lot of progress and make the problem a lot simpler. So I'm talking about this paper not just because it's an interest in its own right, but it illustrates, I think, the types of techniques that are important theoretically in uh, public finance, which is to be very aware of what you're able to estimate and then make a reasonable set of assumptions to simplify the problem and derive formulas in terms of empirical estimable parameters. So this, is, this paper is a good example of trying to make progress on that front. So they make three assumptions. First, they ignore income effects. Second, they ignore interactions with commodities other than labor, okay? So take again the example of the gas tax, which is the application they're gonna think about in the end. Essentially, if you think about the US economy, it's true that increased taxes on gasoline might affect you know, tax revenue from, uh, say, selling some other commodities, okay? Uh, uh, so you know, buying clothes or something like that. So in principle, there could be interactions across all these markets. But those are all basically minor relative to the labor market, where you have a big pre-existing tax. And so that term that you get from the labor market, the cross price elasticity term times the tax rate, is going to be much bigger in the labor market than all the others. So basically they say, let's forget about all the other markets and assume that you only have one other pre-existing tax in the labor market. Third, and this is the most important assumption and the most innovative thing conceptually, is that they assume the good that's being taxed, gasoline, is of average substitu substitutability with labor. That is, mathematically, the cross partial DL D tau K equals the mean cross partial across all the consumption goods in the economy. And I'll explain why this third assumption is important in a second. Okay, so let's work through what they actually do. So in the end, they end up with a formula for the marginal excess burden of raising the tax on good K that looks like this. The first term is totally familiar to you. All it is is taking the term on the previous page but rewriting it ter in terms of elasticity instead of uh, with the derivative. Okay, so we've just multiplied and divide, multiplied by the quantity over the price and put price over quantity and made into the elasticity. All right. The second term is 
the term that's coming from the labor market. What's important to notice about that term and what's the key innovation of this paper is that they do not need to estimate the cross price elasticity of labor with respect to gasoline, which might be hard to do. Instead, they're able to write the formula purely in terms of the own price elasticity, meaning what is the effect of a change in the tax rate on labor income, on labor supply, on which there's an enormous literature, which we'll talk about later. So what they're saying is, in order to answer this problem, what's the marginal debt rate cost of a gasoline tax, I need to know how gasoline taxes affect gasoline demand, which is fine, I know how to do that. And then I need to know what the labor supply elasticity is, how does labor supply change when income tax rates change, which I also have a lot of existing estimates of. So now I have an empirically implementable formula. SK here is the budget share of good K. So what fraction of my budget am I spending on gasoline? So the key advance, just in this formula, so, so we understand what progress they're making, is that they've derived a formula in terms of own price elasticities instead of cross price elasticities. So now let's talk about how the assumptions that they made allow them to get to this, uh, to this formula. All right, so the first thing uh, you want to note is that, um, uh, let me just run through this slide, it's redundant with the bullets in the previous slide. So why do we only need to estimate A to L, right? Step one uh, in their argument is, is to recognize that a consumption tax and a labor income tax have equivalent effects. So this is an old result and something that follows immediately from the budget constraint and you should be familiar with. So what we're saying here is, suppose I levy a tax of 10% on all consumption goods in the economy. Or suppose I levy a labor income tax of 10%. That is, you have to pay 10% of your labor income to the government. Those two things are going to have exactly equivalent effects on the amount that you work. Right? So you, should, you can see that immediately from the budget constraint. An increase in the price of all consumption goods has the same effect on the budget constraint and hence the same effect on labor supply as an increase in the tax on labor. So look at the budget constraint, right? It looks like that total expenditure equals total gross earnings. If I put a one plus tau here, that is I inflate the price of all the consumption goods by 10, say 10%. Or I put a one minus tau on the right hand side, uh, that is I tax you on your labor income, it has the same net impact, right? So think about it intuitively. If I tell you all market goods are going to be 10% more expensive, that is I've driven up real prices of consumption by 10%, and you earn the same nominal amount, the marginal rate of return to working is effectively falling. And so you want to work less. Just like if I directly told you um, that I'm taxing your labor income by 10%. Right? So these two things are basically uh, are, are equivalent and so the first thing to recognize, you can see where this is leading. What this tells you is if I tax all consumption goods, I don't need to worry about estimating a cross price elasticity. I know that the impact is going to be the same as if I just tax labor income. And then I can estimate the own price elasticity of labor supply with respect to the labor income tax rate. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's the first step. The second step is now we're not taxing all consumption goods. We're only taxing gasoline. We're only taxing one market, right? So what they do then is, you know, think about it like this. Suppose I rank all goods in the economy according to their complementarity with labor. So some goods like uh, work-related products might be very complementary with labor. Other goods might be um, substitutes with labor. They might be complementary with leisure, like the TV example. Let's take the one in the middle, okay? Uh, the one that's in the, the mean in terms of DLD tau k. A tax increase on that good is going to have the same effect as an increase in the sales tax D on all consumption goods scaled down by the share of that good. Okay, so that's the second critical point. So before we were talking about an example where we're just applying this one plus tau to all the consumption goods. Now what they show is that if I apply that one plus tau to only consumption good 10, and that one is in the middle in terms of uh, complementarity, that's essentially doing the same exact thing, but because you're only applying it to this one good, you dilute the tax by the share of expenditure on that good. So if I'm spending like 5% of my budget on that good, it's like a 1 20th of a 10% tax on all the consumption goods. 
because I've picked the one in the middle in terms of complementarity with respect to labor, right? And so, as a result, the cross elasticity of L with respect to tau K is equivalent to eta L, the own price elasticity of labor with respect to the labor income tax rate, times SK, the share of good K. So in other words, the labor supply elasticity eta L is sufficient to calculate the cross elasticity for the good that has the average level of substitutability. And that brings you then to this formula that they derive. So any questions? Yeah. So you say you rank them. Is it the, the mean? Uh, it's the mean, not the median. I'm just yeah. saying rank them to give you some interview. Okay. Yeah, just as an explanatory. Um, right. Other questions? OK. So what's the point of this? So they calibrate the formula using existing elasticity estimates of these two parameters. And then they show you that the deadweight loss of tax in goods like gasoline is probably underestimated by a factor of 10 in practice because of the income tax. So what they're saying is people have focused on gas taxation and the deadweight cost of gas taxes within that market, but they're really missing the first order part of the picture, which is the labor market. Uh, and that's really important given existing estimates of the elasticities. We'll talk about A to L at length in uh, a later part of this class. Now, one interesting caveat in my mind is, is it actually true that gas taxes and labor income taxes sort of operate in the same way? I don't know. I mean, if you think about it from like a salience point of view, I might understand very well if you're taking half of my paycheck and I only get you know, $5 per hour instead of $10 per hour. But if the price of gas goes up by a little bit, do I make the calculation, do I make the connection that now in effect it's more costly for me to get to work and therefore I should work less and so forth and so on. The neoclassical model assumes that it operates exactly the same way, but in practice, you know, we don't, I, I think that's an empirical question if you allow for um, like bounded rationality or salience effects. And in fact, there's a recent paper, uh, which is an experimental paper, called Are Consumption and Income Taxes Really Equivalent? Uh, and I, if I remember correctly, they run an experiment. It's a lab experiment where they vary income taxes. So they have people doing these tasks where they work and earn some money and then can use, them, use the money to buy pizza or something like that. Is that I think that's right. Um, and they do two variants where uh, they, they're changing taxes on the things you can buy, like the pizza, or they're changing taxes on the income. And they show that actually the income tax has much bigger effects than the uh, consumption tax. So I think that's kind of an interesting area to think about, because there's a lot of policy discussion about consumption tax taxation versus income taxation. Uh, and my sense is this could actually be a first order force in, depending, in determining what the consequences of those systems are. OK, so. Um, We've derived, I've tried to show you like a bunch of variants of deriving these formulas that are empirically implementable for uh, calculating the deadweight cost of taxes in terms of elasticities that we can estimate. But now I want to step back and contrast this approach. All of this stuff is basically variants of Harberger's initial insight with a totally different way of looking at the problem. And then that's going to set up uh, this broader discussion we'll have on structural methods versus sufficient statistic methods. Okay, so Harberger's formulas are great because they're empirically implementable, uh, as we've just seen, but they are approximate. So we're making these approximations, in particular, ignoring nonlinearities in the demand function and so on. So, or, or you know, a probably more important example is like I was telling you, it's really messy to derive these formulas when you have both income effects and endogenous producer prices. And then it really depends upon various assumptions. So what do you do in situations like that? So an alternative approach, I think a different paradigm in economics, is structural estimation of the demand model. So some of taking I.O. classes, this is kind of the uh, starting point in I.O., where you specify the structure of a market, supply and demand, and then estimate the structural primitives of that model instead of estimating these reduced form elasticities. Right. So let's be precise about what that is. This approach goes back to a paper by Hausman in 81 in the ADR, where uh, you start by estimating, say, Marshallian demand functions, like Harberger. 
So you estimate a price elasticity, you estimate an income elasticity, but then rather than computing the Hicksian and then trying to do something, do something directly with that, you then step back and say, okay, now I have this demand function. I'm gonna integrate that demand function in order to recover the underlying indirect utility function that generated that. Okay, so this is like basic price theory. Given a demand function, you can figure out which utility function generated that demand function. And maybe you've worked through some examples in the past where for particular types of demand functions, like if you have a log linear demand function, there's a certain constant elasticity utility function that would have produced that. That's one example of this, right? Okay, so if I tell you what the shape of the demand function is, I can figure out what utility function was behind it. I can then invert that indirect utility function to get an <coughs> expenditure function. So why invert? Because the expenditure function is the inverse of the indirect utility function, and you can show. And now, once I've recovered what this expenditure function is, like I literally know what that function is, then it's just a matter of arith arithmetic, right? I just plug in different values for the prices, and I can literally compute how excess burden changed when I changed the tax system. And I can have an incredibly complicated tax system, and I can have income effects, and I can model the supply side and do the same thing, recover the underlying production technology. So I can do a lot of simulations and generate whatever uh, answer whatever policy questions I'm interested in. So the parametric approach to doing this was what Hausman did. Okay, so parametric approach means he specifies a parametric form for the consumption function, which links with an indirect utility function and an expenditure function, and then you can back out all the parameters. A non-parametric version of that was developed by Hausman and Newey, where now you just allow a flexible demand function without a particular functional form, and then you could do the same recoverability exercise if you have enough data. So while in this context, these two things don't seem that different because you're really starting from like a similar uh, consumption function that you're estimating, like even for Harberger, you need to estimate alpha and delta, right? So in this totally simple example, it seems like these two things are pretty similar. What I want to stress is that intellectually, you're going about the problem in a very different way. You're recovering the structural primitives in one case, like what the parameters of the utility function are. And in the other case, you're just estimating these price elasticities, which are a function of various parameters and not uh, structural primitives. Okay? And now we're gonna see in more general examples how these two approaches will diverge. So um, there's, uh, so as I was just saying, this underscores the broader difference between structural and quasi-experimental uh, methodologies. The modern literature in public finance, uh, not just in the context of taxation, but throughout this course in the context of welfare analysis, I think probably one of the most important developments is the derivation of sufficient statistic formulas that can be implemented using quasi-experimental techniques. Now we're going to develop the general distinction between those two approaches, starting with a simple model of taxation. Okay. So to make it easy in the lecture, we're going to assume that we have no income effects, that is we have quasi-linear utility. We're going to assume that we have fixed producer prices, that is we have constant returns to production. But we're going to introduce some other features that we were abstracting from before. So first of all, we're going to allow there to be multiple goods. In many of the examples we were talking about before Golder and Williams, there was a two-good setting. And then we're going to allow for heterogeneity and discrete choice and various other things and see uh, what that does. Okay, so to be clear, this is the framework we're going to use to illustrate uh, the distinction between these two approaches. So we're going to take an N good model. The goods are X1 to Xn. Prices uh, denoted by P1 to Pn. Those are pre-tax prices. Wealth Z. We're going to let good N be the numerator. Okay. And we're going to consider the case where a government levies a tax of T on good one. The individual takes T as given and solves this utility maximization problem, which is standard. But notice that I'm assuming quasi-linear utility. Utility is linear and good end. And then this is utility over the other goods. This is total expenditure. And this is his wealth. Okay. okay, to measure the excess burden of a tax, one way to think about what the excess burden is, is how much surplus is lost from the system when I raise the tax. So let's define social welfare. 
as the sum of individuals' utility and tax revenue. All right, so you'll see me do this a bunch of times. The term in brackets here, in curly brackets, is individuals' utility. Okay, that's the individual's total surplus. What am I doing there? It's the utility that you get from consuming the n minus one goods, plus this term here, which is the money you have left over for the nth good, for the numerator. Okay. And then here is just tax revenue. So that's the other part of what's still in the system. So you have the private surplus. That's what we call the term in brackets, private surplus. It's total individual utility plus producer surplus if there were any. And then government, <coughs> right? So that's total surplus W of T. Now, notice that I'm able to do this addition like this because I have a quasi-linear utility function, right? If it was not quasi-linear, it wouldn't make any sense to add utils to the dollars that the government's getting. But here, everything's measured in dollars. So our goal is to measure dw dt, which is the loss in social surplus caused by the tax change. <coughs> so how much are we getting losing from the system when I raise t? Now, this is going to be a negative number because the tax creates distortion. So obviously, if this is actually what social welfare was, you, you know the answer that you want to have a zero tax rate. There's no point in having taxes here. But usually, you're raising taxes to fund something else that generates value, like a school or something. And so there's an added term, and that leads to the optimal tax or optimal public goods literature. But here, we are just focusing on the cost side. What are the efficiency costs of raising tax revenue? All right, so let's now talk about, at a high level, two different ways you can go about answering this question, what is DWDT? What is the loss in welfare from raising the tax? The first approach is uh, <laughs> what uh, I'm going to call the structural method, I think the traditional method in economics. And it's in some ways, I think, the intellectually most obvious way to proceed and the most principled way to proceed. So we've got a bunch of primitives in a model. In this model, the primitives are just the utility function uh, and the budget constraint. Okay, so very simple primitive. What we mean by primitives more generally are things like borrowing constraints. We're going to talk about dynamic models of unemployment insurance where people might hit borrowing constraints with some probability. Uh, we might have other technological primitives like in education. We have an um, education production function or you know, something that matters. <coughs> the inputs that you get in education to achievement and long-term impacts and so forth. So there are a bunch of things that are the basic production functions, uh, utility functions, and constraints of the model, right? Now, the structural approach takes these primitives, tries to estimate all of those primitives, and maps them directly then to uh, answering this question DWDT, or estimating DWDT. So once I've specified and fully estimated all the parameters of a model, I can say, as I've been emphasizing, I can do simulations of how any policy change affects the total amount of welfare in that setting. Okay? So that's a totally coherent approach, provided that I specify the right structure and estimate all these primitives correctly. The second approach, which is the approach that's very popular in public finance, um, and al allows public finance to connect, I think, to applied micro and labor economics uh, is, is as follows. So rather than estimating this vector omega of primitives, we derive a formula like Harberger did. It's one of the classic examples. Or Summers on capitalization is another example of that. Derive a formula that maps um, a limited set of statistics, like let's say a small a uh, set of parameters like the price elasticity and the income elasticity to uh, the change in welfare from changing the tax. Okay, so I derive a formula for DWDT in terms of, say, price and income elasticities. Now, those price and income elasticities are a function of all of these underlying structural primitives in the model. Okay, so the point is that um, these elasticities here which we can typically identify using program evaluation methods. That's what makes it attractive to write the formula in this way. I can use a simple quasi-experiment to understand how changes in prices or changes in taxes affect demand. 
it's much harder for me to figure out you know, what a person's risk aversion is or what their discount rate is to recover these structural parameters. So I can identify these beta parameters um, using, let's say, some uh, simple research design. Those beta parameters are going to be a function of omega and the tax rate. And the key thing to remember is that they are not going to uniquely identify omega. So usually what you'll see is that the number of elasticities we end up estimating is like two or three, but we might have 100 underlying primitives. So the way to think about what's going on is that we have a formula that maps beta to DWDT. There are multiple omega vectors that are going to generate exactly the same beta. And all of those omega vectors are going to generate exactly the same answer to the welfare question of interest. That last thing is the key thing. That you don't need to under, um, understand the underlying structure of a model from the perspective of, under, of answering this question. There are many different models that might match the reduced form elasticity you estimate, but that whole class of models is going to generate exactly the same answer to the policy question of interest. And that's how you end up distilling the problem to a much, much simpler uh, question. Okay, you, you reduce the set of parameters you're trying to estimate to just two instead of a very large number. Okay, and we'll talk about various examples of basically this idea. Now, one thing that I'll say here, but hopefully it will become clearer what I mean later on, is notice that beta is a function not just of the structural primitives, but also of the current tax rate. So one of the limitations of the sufficient statistic approach is you're only going to be able to do local welfare analysis around the domain of the elasticities that you estimate. So if you're estimating an elasticity, let's say changing tax rates from 40 to 45 percent, you learn something about welfare in that range. But if you want to make a prediction about what would happen if you change tax rates to 90 percent, like way out of sample, because um, beta is a function of those tax rates. Because the elasticities might vary with the tax rate, you can't necessarily extrapolate out of sample. So some of you might have heard in macro classes about the Lucas critique. This is exactly the Lucas critique in uh, empirical work. It's basically the, uh, the same idea. So that's a limitation. And then we'll talk about uh, whether, you know, how that affects you in, in various contexts. Okay, so that's a high level overview. I think you'll grasp it much better once we go through uh, various examples. Questions? OK, so let's now talk about applying the two approaches to the model that we talked about. The model where we have N goods and uh, consumers are buying these goods and we're introducing a tax in one market. So what's the structural method? It would be to estimate that N good demand system, right? So let's say you've got 100 different goods. You would estimate the demand curves for all the goods. You'd recover the underlying utility function. So for instance, you might use like a stone Geary specification to recover the preference parameters, which is what's done in the traditional literature. And then you can calculate exact consumer surpluses and have them in Now remember, just to be clear on what, why do you need to estimate the demand curves in all 100 markets in order to implement the structural approach? Because when I raise the tax on good one, it's not like it only affects the market for good one, right? It might affect the amount of work. It might affect the amount of something else. It's a complement or substitute. We're not putting any structure on any of that. So to recover the utility function, you need to estimate the demand curves in all the markets. And so as I say in this uh, sufficient statistics article, that basically is a, is a complicated empirical problem because you need a lot of instruments, right? In order to estimate 100 demand curves, you need 100 instruments. Uh, and we know how hard it is to come up with research designs even to estimate one parameter credibly. So that's a complicated problem. Right, so the alternative is Harberger's dead weight loss triangle formula, which I'll now show you works in this multi-good model. Okay, so somebody had asked a question in the previous class about whether this works in GE, and uh, it actually does. So we'll see that here. Okay, so here's how all of these derivatives are going to go. The private sector choices are made to maximize the term shown in red here. That is the term in curly brackets, private surplus. So one of the critical assumptions is that people in the private sector, individuals in this case, who are the only agents, are acting to maximize their utility. They are optimizing it, right? So they're choosing X, the sector X to maximize this function. And then you've got the government revenue added on. Now, you have envelope conditions for X1 to Xn uh, 
which allow us to ignore the behavioral responses DXIDT in the term in red when you differentiate this function with respect to tau, and that's really the key thing. Okay, so I think there's often confusion about this, so let me uh, try to be clear. The point is not that when I introduce a small tax, behavior changes very little, so I can ignore the behavioral response. That's not the logic. The logic is dx1 d tau might be very big, so when I introduce it 10 percent, <coughs> there could be a big, pretty big change in behavior. Okay. But the point is, if I'm optimizing, <coughs> I've set x1. Um, so if, if, if this is utility as a function of x1, um, I have chosen x1 star to be at this point, right, by utility maximization, which is we're assuming you're maximizing utility. So even if you change uh, consumption of the good, you reduce consumption of the good quite a bit um, when the tax is introduced, that has a relatively minor effect on your utility because utility is locally flat around the optimizing point, right, around the optimum. So it doesn't matter how big dx1 uh, dt is, the point is dw dx1 is locally close to zero, right, that's what the envelope theorem. Uh, is telling you as a result of optimization. So the, basically the reason this works and this technique is popular in public finance is a, what a lot of the field is about is optimizing a function where part of that function has already been optimized subject to some constraints in the private sector. And so this tool is going to end up being useful because of that mathematical structure in many, many problems, right? Agents are doing something to optimize given the system imposed by the government various constraints. And then the government is assumed to be a benevolent social planner is optimizing that partially optimized function. And so you can see why this uh, ends up being highly relevant. Okay. So given that, what that means is all I need to do is pay attention to the places where T appears directly when differentiating that equation, right? And so dw dt, I get a minus x1 coming from the red part here. What is that? That's just a mechanical effect. If I raise taxes by ten dollars or like you're, you're consuming ten units of good x1 i raise taxes by a dollar on good x1 i have taken ten dollars away from you right that's this first term now i get a corresponding mechanical term of the government revenue that ten dollars comes to me as the government so that's the plus x1 but then i have the behavioral response which is coming from the fact that this part here has not been optimized or has not been internalized what is has not been internalized me here this thing is not in the red part, which is being maximized, right? The, the essentially, this connects to a couple of things. First of all, you can see it connects to that revenue leakage formula. The distortion is coming totally from the fact that the government is losing some revenue because of the behavioral response. The other thing which will connect to later in the class is basically the consumer is having an externality on the government. This is what we call a fiscal externality. Because of the tax system, my consumption of X1, act, or let's say like my work effort, actually generates some surplus for somebody else. Like the more I work, the more tax revenue the government gets. But I don't take that into account when I'm optimizing. And because of that externality, the so-called fiscal externality, because we have this tax system, there is that weight loss. It's fundamentally related to externalities as well. Right? Okay, so what do we see here? We get this formula, T dx1 dt. In this very simple sense, dx1 dt is a sufficient statistic for calculating dw dt. Notice that I do not need to know dx2 dt, dx3 dt. I don't need to know all the cross price elasticities, etc. Um, I'm assuming that there are no, pre, no taxes in the other markets, by the way. That's actually important for what I just said. But in this context, rather than estimating the end good demand system, all I have to do is estimate the slope of that one curve. OK, so that's a very Simple example, let's now see how it works in a more complicated setting. So the benefits of this efficient statistic approach, I think, become particularly evident now once you start to allow for heterogeneity, which is very common in structural models. We don't want to assume that everybody has the same utility function, right? We want to allow for heterogeneous preferences. So let's say we have k agents, each of whom has a utility function u of k, u sub k, over the n minus 1 goods, and then everybody's closer <coughs> than you in the n good, right? 
So the social welfare function then, under a utilitarian criterion, we're just adding up everybody's utilities, is given by this expression here, where all this is is just summing everyone's utilities uh, in the brackets again, and then total government revenue which is the tax T applied to each guy's purchases, adding up the revenue for each guy, right? Okay, what's the structural method? Estimate demand systems for all the agents. Now you can see the problem has become NK dimensional, right? So N demand systems for K types of people in the economy is yet more complicated. But what's uh, quite useful is that the sufficient statistic formula is completely unchanged. You still only need to estimate the slope of the aggregate demand curve. You don't even need microdata because if you just work this out, BWDT, get this mechanical term here from inside the brackets, get this mechanical term from the government revenue, and then you get these behavioral responses. But D sum of X1 K DT is just DX1 DT where X1 is aggregate demand. And so what that means is all I need to know is uh, you know the total number of cars that were sold as a function of the tax rate. I do not need microdata on all the various individuals, which is incredibly valuable from an uh, empirical perspective. Okay. Yes. So why is it max of sum rather than sum of max in the equation? I should be. Um, I mean, it's the same thing in this case, but. If you think about it as summing the each individual maximizing his utility, you're right, should be sum of max. It's actually going to connect to what I'm going to show you next. So another way you can recast all of these problems is as the planner acting on the beha behalf of the agents. So the planner choosing the optimal allocation. Uh, and then you would think of it as max over uh, of the sum. So either way, it doesn't matter. Uh, the really depends a lot on the it does not depend on the quasi-linearity, actually. Everything works then with the Hicksian uh, demand. Um, as, we kinda, as we talked about before, but all this heterogeneous stuff still works, actually. Yes? So the, the benefit that we would have with a uh, structural approach would be that we could look at distributional effects, how individual people's welfare is affected? Sure. I mean, so. You know, your question is right on get set. So sufficient statistics, the way you want to think about it is there is a set of sufficient statistics for a particular question that you right. see the answer is And this is aggregate welfare. Right. So suppose we're interested in aggregate welfare. This is the sufficient statistic, right? Now, suppose you're interest, interested in distributional effects across K types of guys. The way you want to think about it is not necessarily that means I need to fully structurally estimate the model. Of course, that would be one way to proceed. But there could be a different, a larger set of sufficient statistics, like let's say impacts on demand for K types of people in the economy, that would allow you to say something about distributional impacts without fully structurally estimating the model. So it, it's not that if you so ask... We're not, we're not just making the problem simpler. That's not... If we're, we're actually gaining something from the approach. We're not, we're not simply focusing yes. on a simpler problem. No, no, no. That's not the way you want to think about it. And you, I think in this example, it may seem like that, but especially as we go through this class, you'll see more com fairly complex examples where we'll still be able to reduce the problem to a few uh, parameters of interest. But your question gets to what is a core issue, which is you need to estimate a different set of parameters for different questions. Whereas in the structural approach, you estimate the structural primitives no matter what question you want to answer. Right? So it's more work in a sense because every time you want to do something else, like a distributional analysis, you need to go back and estimate more. Okay, let's talk about another uh, variant of the model. So, discrete choice is a very commonly uh, analyzed situation where, uh, well, so, you know, what's this, we're talking about continuous problems until now, right? Like you're choosing the number of units of x, you choose not whether to buy or not. But in many contexts, we think discrete choice is more plausible. Do you go to college or not? Do you buy a car or not? Do you buy a house or not, et cetera? Okay, so you might think ex ante, all of this stuff we're doing relies on differentiating these conditions and relies on like continuity properties, right? So you would think that discrete choice might pose a problem because these functions don't look smooth anymore. But this is 
uh, where recasting the problem as the planner's problem is useful, and you can see the thing actually still ends up working. So let's let um, the valuation that agent K has for good one be given by BK. So this is the amount that I value going to college or the amount I value buying the car, and then I choose whether to buy or not. Let F of B denote the distribution of valuation in the economy, which I'm going to assume is smooth. This is actually going to generate the smoothness property that we need. With two goods, the utility of agent K is just given by, let's simplify the two goods to make it easy here, uh, is given by this. So this is the utility from uh, X1 if I choose to consume it, if I set X1 equals 1 plus the amount of money I have left over to spend on the second good, right, in which utility is limited. So what's social welfare? So here I'm starting out putting the max on the inside of the summation, right, like coming back to your question. So uh, I can think of social welfare here. The first term is private surplus, second term is government revenue. Now, because this distribution is smooth, it's not a sum, it's an integral over that distribution, right? And each guy, uh, K within, you know, in that distribution is picking X1 of K to maximize its utility. Okay. And then total government revenue is just the total amount of the good that's purchased uh, times the tax rate. So that problem is not smooth at the individual level. So what do I mean? When I change the tax rate by epsilon, there are going to be jumps in people's demand functions. They're going to they're be step functions, right? And that's not going to allow you to apply the envelope theorem, which is what we've underlined. All right, so what do you do? You recast the, uh, this problem as the planner's problem. It's a very useful technique we often use in public finance. Uh, so because the planner is benevolent, we can um, rewrite this problem as, uh, as the following. So we know that the solution is going to be that people who have a valuation above a certain threshold buy the good, and people who have valuation below the threshold don't buy it, right? So it's easy to, to prove that. So uh, you can then write the problem as picking the single cutoff B bar above which you assign people the good, and below which you don't, uh, people don't buy the good. And so then thinking about it from the planner's point of view, the way private surplus is set is by maximizing over B bar, and then the guys above B bar, they buy the good and pay for it, so they get a utility of BK minus P1 uh, plus tau. And then the guys who, and then there's this second term that comes uh, because a bunch of people don't buy the good, right? Uh, and they're spending all of their money. The guys below B bar are spending all of their money on good too. Okay, so their utility is just C. So from the private surplus point of view, I, I just want to pick B bar. Uh, I just want to pick the, the optimal cutoff. And then the tax revenue is the tax rate times the fraction of guys who have valuations above that threshold. So now this is a smooth problem, right? Because the distribution is smooth, and I'm picking that one variable B bar. Uh, and so that function on the inside there is going to be a smooth function of uh, B bar that is going to satisfy the condition we needed to apply the envelope there. And so we again then, it turns out, obtain the Harvard formula as a function of the slope of the aggregate demand curve. So let's see how this works. Just uh, simple algebra. We differentiate the inside here with respect to B bar. What is What you get there, it's that mechanical effect minus 1 minus F of B bar. So this is just the guys above B bar are buying, and they lose a dollar when you raise the tax rate by a dollar. This is the mechanical transfer to the government, and this is the behavioral response. What is this term in the integral here? That's just the total consumption of good X1 in the market, like the total number of cars that are sold. So what does the formula end up being? Exactly the same as what we had before. So notice what we've done, we've varied the underlying structure of the model in various ways, but haven't changed uh, the formula for the efficiency cost of the tax at all. And so this is an example of what I was talking about back here, where I'm basically showing you there are multiple omegas that are consistent with a given value of dx1 dt, a given value of, let's say, xn. Uh, 
demand elasticity. And all of those underlying structures are going to produce exactly the same answer uh, to the welfare question of interest if you were to do the structural, if you were to structurally estimate the demand. Right? So why is the Harberger result so robust? Let's just talk a little bit about the logic of it. We've gone through the math of it in various examples. So one way to think about it is that deadweight loss is fully determined by the difference between the marginal willingness to pay for good X1 and its cost uh, P1. So as we were talking about earlier with like the loss surplus due to transactions that didn't occur, right? Uh, what I need to know is how much would you have been willing to pay for the tenth unit of the good minus the cost of production, which wouldn't be a flat supply curve, it's just the price, all right? So how do I recover the marginal willingness to pay? Well, I can get that uh, directly from the slope of the demand curve because I know if the agent optimizes, and this is why optimization is critical, I know if he's going to set demand for good x such that u prime of x equals p. And u prime of x is just the marginal willingness to pay for the good, right? That's the marginal utility the guy's getting from that unit of the good. So what that means is I can read off from the empirically estimated demand curve what the willingness to pay for each unit of the good is as a consequence of optimization. And then I just take the difference between that and um, the cost in order to infer the efficiency cost of the tax. That is, the slope of the demand curve is sufficient to infer the efficiency cost of the tax without identifying the rest of the model. It doesn't matter if the marginal guy is, there's heterogeneity and he's a different person, or if he's you know, discreetly consuming one more, he's entering or exiting the market. All of that doesn't matter. All that matters is the marginal valuation, that is, the height of the demand curve at a point relative to the price. Because you can see that that's economically why this formula always works and under all these conditions. Okay, okay so let's, so we've done a bunch of theoretical setup. Let's now uh, actually talk about some empirical applications of, uh, of these tools to uh, current policy problems of interest. So we'll first talk about income taxation. Um, this is going to be sort of an applied version of what we just talked about. We won't really get into empirical work on income taxation here. We'll then talk about this paper by Jim Paterba, which is a nice application to thinking about the um, deadweight cost of the housing subsidy in the US, the fact that uh, mortgage interest is uh, tax exempt. And then we'll talk about an application to diesel fuel taxation in a recent paper. So following Harberger, there was a very large literature in labor economics that estimated the effect of taxes on hours of work to assess the efficiency costs of taxation. So this is the most intuitive way to think about it. Uh, if I want to understand what the deadweight cost of having um, higher income tax rates in the US is, you might think, let me see how much people say they would work, or you know, how many hours uh, people report working with higher and lower tax rates, uh, and estimate the slope of that supply curve. Now, Feldstein, in a pair of very influential papers in the 90s, observed that labor supply should really not be thought of as just the number of hours that you work, because after all, you could show up at work and log a lot of hours, but don't really do anything. Uh, and so you want to think about many other dimensions. So he thinks about effort, which is what I was just describing, but also things like training. So how much do I invest in trying to acquire the skills to get a better job? Um, that could depend upon tax rates, but may not show up in hours of work, right? Or what type of occupation do I take? Do I take a really high stress, high pay job, or do I take a lower stress, lower paying job? So all of these margins could, in principle, be distorted by taxes. Moreover, taxes could also induce inefficient avoidance and evasion behavior, which we do actually see in practice. We'll see some clear evidence of that later, where people are trying to manipulate their income or, or shelter their income in the form of other sources uh, in order to minimize their tax burdens. OK, so let's think about how we would proceed in a model where we have multiple dimensions of labor supply uh, to calculate the efficiency cost of income taxation. So again, I think the first thing you might think of is a structural approach, which there are some elements of in the literature, which would say, let's account for each of the potential responses that might occur to an income tax. 
and then add them up, and then aggregate. So for example, Glenn Hubbard has a paper on how taxes affect occupational choice. There are other studies of how, um, you, know, you could imagine doing a study of how taxes affect the amount of training that people undertake, or even if you could somehow measure effort, you might try to look at that. Now, Feldstein proposes an alternative, which at the time was not called a sufficient statistic approach, but can be interpreted as exactly that. Um, he shows that the elasticity of taxable income with respect to taxes is a sufficient statistic for calculating dead weight loss. So what is taxable income? Taxable income, think of that as just what you write down on the tax form as your total income, what you report to the IRS. Uh, and his main result, which we will derive now, is that the elasticity of that object, which we see in tax data with respect to tax rates, is adequate for calculating debt weight loss, even if you have all these other margins uh, underneath. That's a really powerful result because we tend to have good tax data. That's exactly what we can measure well, taxable income. And so it's perfect because you don't need to worry about measuring hours, which is really hard because everybody tells you they work 40 hours a week without thinking about it. But uh, taxable income is actually well reported. And you can, that's led to this huge literature which we'll talk about later on estimating taxable income last Is there a question? Okay. So deriving the Feldstein result. So the government levies a linear tax of T on reported taxable income. And the agent makes N labor supply choices, L1 to LN. Think of these as each of the margins on which I might adjust labor supply, like effort, hours, et cetera. Each choice LI has some disutility psi I of LI and has some return, which I'm going to call WI, the wage for that margin. In addition, agents can shelter their income, let's call the amount of sheltering they do E, from taxation by paying some cost G of E. Now there has to be some cost of evasion or cost of sheltering, otherwise everybody's gonna to go to the corner of just evading all of their uh, tax liability, right? So taxable income then is defined as total gross earnings minus the amount that you evade or shelter or choose not to report to the IRS. Consumption is given by tax income net of tax income, so that's 1 minus T applied to TI, plus the amount that I take under the table, which is not subject to tax. We're going to assume here that the agent's utility is quasi-linear in consumption. You'll see throughout the lecture, I'll tend to make this assumption just because it makes the math simpler. Uh, but all of this stuff works with income and tax. Uh, so agent's utility quasi-linear in consumption, so he's got this utility from consumption C, this cost that he pays G of E uh, for evading, and then the disutilities of the various margins of labor supply, just add them all up. Social welfare is, again, private surplus in brackets, the agent's utility, plus total tax revenue, T times TI. Differentiating and applying the now familiar envelope condition, basic, very similar basic logic. Uh, so you, know, you can think of it as just totally differentiate this equation and apply these first order conditions or just directly think about it from the envelope theorem perspective, it's the same thing. And you get now the familiar looking terms, the mechanical loss for the consumer, the mechanical <coughs> loss for the government, plus um, this term, minus D, D, T, I, D, T, which looks very much like the Harberger formula, and that's the Feldstein result basically, right? All I need to know is DTIDT in order to calculate the dead weight cost of the tax. I don't care if you got more training, you did, um, you know, you started evading more, you started working fewer hours, it doesn't matter. So that's a really powerful result in simplifying the problem. What's the economic intuition for it? It's that the marginal social cost of reducing earnings through any margin is equated at the optimum. The reason I don't care whether you reduced hours or reduced effort is because you are optimizing. So I'm gonna assume that you did you know, the best balance of reducing hours and effort. And all I need to know is the aggregate impact on the amount that you earn uh, and the government budget, right? Um, okay. So as I was saying, the simplicity of identification in Feldstein's formula has led to a large literature estimating the elasticity of taxable income. But one of the things I wanna illustrate with this 
is that because you're never recovering the underlying primitives, uh, these types of formulas can also be somewhat dangerous because you're never testing the underlying assumptions of the model. So one thing to keep in mind is when you derive and apply these sufficient statistic formulas, it's not like you're making no modeling assumptions. Any formula, any analysis of welfare requires some model in the background, some structure. And all the <coughs> here is saying we don't need to fully identify all of that structure in order to answer the question of interest. Now, one potential virtue of the structural approach is you might find that your model is actually wrong. And the way you might find that is if you try to estimate all the structural primitives, sometimes you'll find cases <coughs> where the model just doesn't fit the data. right? So you can do like a goodness of fit test and say, the patterns in the data are not reconcilable at all with this model. You will never figure that out with the sufficient statistic approach. Because you will say, I've derived this formula. I'm going to assume my model is right. I then estimate the taxable income elasticity, and I make some policy recommendation. But I could be totally wrong if my model is wrong, right? So let me illustrate that with a specific case that um, where you're making a decision here that may or may not be right. So in this paper in 2009, is the AEJ paper, I uh, questioned the validity of the assumption that g prime of e equals t. So just to come back here. Optimization in this framework uh, implies that the marginal social cost of evasion equals the tax rate. So that last dollar of income that I choose to hide, the marginal uh, cost of doing that if my tax rate is 40 cents, the marginal cost must have been 40 cents right, for me to be at an optimum. Now, is that necessarily the case in practice? So here's how I start thinking about it. I think some costs of avoidance or evasion are transfers to other agents in the economy rather than real social resource costs. Okay, So I think this cleanest and simplest example is think about a potential fine imposed by the government. Why are you not evading taxes? For a lot of people, it's because you're worried about getting caught and worried about having to pay a fine. Now, a fine is not a deadweight loss. A fine is additional revenue to the government. It's just a transfer from one guy to another. So some penalties uh, that may deter you from evasion need not be pure resource costs. So for instance, uh, if what you do is hire a tax lawyer, you know you want to think about tax lawyers as basically being dead weight loss, right? Like a resource cost. Because you are, that's money lost from the system. Those people could be doing something that would be more useful than manipulating the tax code. Uh, but uh, if what I'm doing is worried about the fact that I might get caught with some probability, then at the margin, the marginal cost is not a 40 cent loss in the economy. It's um, possibly much lower. Okay, So let's see how that affects the formula for uh, the dead weight cost of taxation. OK, so uh, here, what I'm going to do is that individuals um, it's the same exact setup as before. Okay? Individuals choose E and L. Just to reduce notation, I'm just going to make the labor supply decision one dimensional. But as we've seen, that makes no difference. Okay? So individuals are going to choose E and L to maximize this utility function, um, where utility is a function of consumption minus your disutility of labor, a convex function psi of L. Uh, and then the way I'm going to think about the cost of evasion is as a transfer cost instead of a resource cost. Okay, so I um, my consumption is let's say some unearned income that I had Y, some wealth, plus one <coughs> times tau times my taxable income, plus the amount I keep under the table minus this cost Z of E. One way you can think about Z of E is the probability P that I'm caught times a fine that I have to pay. So think about this as just the expectation of that. It doesn't make any difference. Right? So social welfare, then, is now given by this term, the same standard thing that appears in brackets, which is uh, the private surplus. But there's a key difference, which is that I have a plus z of e coming in here, which is coming from the fact that the government is collecting that fine with some probability. All right, so it doesn't matter if this is a very small number. Like, Let's say there's a 1% chance I get caught, but I'm worried about that. And in that case, I have to pay, let's say, a $10,000 fine. 
So there's a minus 0.01 times 10,000, and there's a plus 0.01 times 10,000, a function of E on, on, on the other side. So mathematically, the key difference between the way I'm thinking about it here and the Feldstein model is that uh, the plus Z of E is appearing twice. In the Feldstein model, the minus Z of E, or called a G, was uh, there. But it was not there on this side of the government's ledger. But it appears here because of the, because it's a transfer cost. Okay. So how does that affect the formula? So let's let Li equal WL denote total pre-tax earned income. I'm going to call that earned income. And let's let Ti WL minus E denote taxable income. Okay. So two different income concepts. TI is the thing I see on the tax return. LI, we'll talk about how, how can you measure LI, that's the tricky thing. Okay, so we um, exploit now, so do go through a similar math, all right? Exploit the envelope condition for the term in curly brackets. What you end up getting, if you just work through this, uh, you're going to get these mechanical effects like before, but then you get this DZ, DE term because you've got that Z uh, in the optimized part. Right, you end up getting a formula that looks like this. T times dt i dt, this is what we had before, right? And then we've got this added term coming from the fact that the z uh, is uh, coming on the outside of that bracket, right? So what, just coming back here, when I differentiate this thing, I'm going to get a dz de times de dt. That's exactly what that second term is. All right, so one way I can rewrite that is Ti is just Li minus E, right? So this is T times DLI DT minus T DE DT plus uh, that uh, Z term. Now, the next thing to notice is that the first order condition for the individual's choice of E is that he sets the marginal cost of evasion equal to the tax rate. This is what I was giving you the example of before. And so then you plug that in and simplify, and you get dw dt is t times dli dt in this case. Okay. So this um, first order condition, the intuition is just to restate is that the marginal private benefit of raising e by a dollar, uh, what that gets you is saving t dollars, saves you the tax, has to equal the marginal private cost, and so as a result. The deadweight cost of the tax chain, all that's changed in this formula is that it's not the taxable income, the uh, detail, it's the labor income, detail. Right? So let's step back from the math. What are we saying intuitively here? What controls deadweight loss when the cost of evasion is a transfer cost rather than a social cost is the impact of the tax on total labor income, total earnings and not taxable income. What's the intuition for that? To the extent that these two things are different, it's because of evasion, right? Evasion has no deadweight cost here. Because all evasion is, is a transfer from one party to another uh, in the economy. And so when I expend effort, sorry, when I am doing evasion, the costs of that are not, uh, to, to me as an individual, are not social costs. They're private costs because I'm worried about incurring these fines, right? Uh, and so to the extent my private costs are benefits to somebody else in the economy, are transfers, there's no deadweight cost from that behavioral response. And the only thing that matters is how the tax affects my total earnings, which is a true distortion, okay? So this is an extreme example, which we also think is probably not true because there are, as we were saying with the lawyer thing, uh, some real resource costs from uh, uh, tax manipulation, from tax evasion. So let's now take the general case where we have both the transfer cost and the resource cost. The resource cost is gonna be like in the Feldstein model, the Z of E is gonna be like in the earlier slide. And then you can work through, again, the same type of analysis, and I won't bother going through these details, but this is the bottom line formula in the 2009 paper where you can show that the marginal deadweight cost of the tax is a weighted average of the taxable income elasticity and the labor income elasticity, okay? Uh, the taxable income elasticity is what's uh, estimated by Feldstein and others, and the labor or total earned income elasticity is uh, 
something that one would estimate you know, using different data. So what is the practical importance of this? If mu, if the weights are such that you, um, uh, are such that the, re the transfer cost is large relative to the resource cost, that's gonna generate a small mu, so you're gonna put a lot of weight on the labor income elasticity instead of taxable income. The practical relevance of that is we've seen a lot of empirical work showing that the reported taxable income of high income individuals is very sensitive to tax rates. So that's a clear empirical regularity in the data, which we'll talk about later. You might have inferred from Feldstein's work that that means the efficiency cost of taxing high income individuals is very large, and so we should have lower top income tax rates. That is not necessarily true if what's deterring high income individuals from reporting high incomes when tax rates are high is this transfer cost rather than a resource cost. Okay. Now, in order to implement this thing empirically, the hardest parameter to identify, and the thing where I don't think we really have still a very good sense of how to do it, is uh, estimating that weight mu. How do you know how much weight to put on the relative things? And that depends upon the marginal resource cost. What is, we need to understand more about the marginal cost of evasion. Is it a resource cost or is it a transfer cost? Can we find a way to back out the relative magnitude of those? That's like a totally open question. I think an interesting question to uh, try to answer. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about in this lecture is an application of this formula that in, on the previous page uh, in a paper by Gorodnichenko and co-authors of the JP um, that illustrates how, how you, illustrates the implication. So they estimate these two elasticities to implement <coughs> the uh, formula in, in the previous slide that permits transfer costs. And their key insight is that I can measure total earnings using consumption data. Because let's say for a moment I abstract from savings. Suppose people are hand to mouth consumers, right? So they set consumption equals income. You might report that you earned $100, but if I see you consuming $120, then you must actually have earned $120, right? So if you're willing to make the assumption that consumption data reveal what people actually earn, then you can basically estimate elasticity of consumption with respect to tax rates to get this, and you can estimate the elasticity of taxable income in the usual way using tax data to get the second one, uh, and figure out what the efficiency cost of the tax actually are. So they <coughs> looked at a 2001 reform in Russia that uh, switch, where they switch to a flat tax, okay? And they look at the gap between taxable income and consumption, which they interpret as being due to evasion uh, in order to analyze the welfare consequences of taxation. So here's what the reform did. This was the marginal income tax rate in uh, Russia prior to 2001. So the step function, progressive tax, uh, very much like in the US. <coughs> And then uh, in 2001, they moved to a flat tax of 13%. So these guys up here in a dip and dip research design were treated more heavily. This is partial intensity of treatment. This is low intensity of treatment. Okay. And here's the key graph. So this is the gap between consumption and income. So think of it as just consumption minus income. Okay. So first of all, you can see that consumption minus income is actually positive in the pre years, so that's consistent with what I was saying. On average, people are like consuming, as reported in survey data, 20% more than uh, they uh, report earning to the tax authority. So that looks like there's some evasion. Uh, and then after the reform right here, the treatment group, which are the higher income guys, experience a particularly large reduction in the consumption income gap relative to the control guys, suggesting that they are cutting back on uh, cutting back on evasion significantly, right? The amount of evasion is significantly reduced by the reduction in tax rates. Okay. And so they then go about uh, to estimate uh, using this type of variation both DTIDT and DLIDT uh, and what, what they conclude is that DTIDT is a large number, whereas the labor income elasticity, DLIDT, uh, is actually not a very large number. And so they argue that Feldstein's formula overestimates the efficiency cost of taxation 
uh, relative to a more general measure, uh, like the formula in the, the reader up here, <coughs> for a plausible value of g prime of e. So they're, they're basically considering a range of what the resource costs are. So of course, if the resource costs, if the costs of evasion are purely resource costs, then the Feldstein formula is right, and it doesn't matter, their analysis doesn't matter. But they're kind of saying, you know, we think that in practice, like these resource costs are not that big in our application. Uh, and they try to use some consumption data to get at that. Uh, but, you know, basically think of it as an argument that the weight on the labor income elasticity should, should be large. And then they argue that the efficiency costs are small. Now, the question <coughs> that's really critical is how do you estimate G prime of E? So one way they think about it is that maybe you can get that from the consumption data itself. So what's the logic there? If it literally is a resource cost, like I have to hire a lawyer in order to evade taxes, um, then that should be reflected in lower consumption, right? Because I'm actually gonna have to pay the guy in order to, uh, in order to do this. But that's not necessarily comprehensive because if, so you know, it, it, this starts to get, to get a little bit muddy when you think about say like a psychological cost of evasion, like you feel bad being a cheater. That is, that should we include that in the utility function and include that in social surplus? You know, maybe yes, because you're actually stressed out and worried about getting caught. Um, and so then that obviously is not gonna show up in consumption data. So that's, I think, uh, the, the key parameter to be estimated here. But you can see the more general lesson is that the formula that you end up getting depends very heavily on the structure of the model. Uh, and you can have a fairly complicated structure, but you've got to think hard about the, whether the general structural assumptions you're making actually uh, fit the problem or this debate illustrates. Do we have to worry about the resources the government has to um, apply yeah. to catching the cheaters? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that yeah. And so that has got to be counted. That's basically going to produce one more term in the government part here, uh, which we're not modeling, and that's going to be a function of E, and then that's going to create one more, uh, one more term. So you want to include that in the resource. All right, so we'll stop there.